Well, hello, everybody. Today is December 2nd, 2020. I almost said 2021. It's 2020. Welcome to Coaching in Context webinar series hosted by Fielding Graduate University. My name is Dr. Carrie Arnold, and I'm the program director for evidence-based coaching here at the university. And today's one-hour webinar is provided by Dr. Gail Greenstein. Her session is eligible for one ICF CEU. And to receive that CEU, you just need to attend this session live. We will track your attendance at the beginning and the end. We will also give you a link to a brief evaluation that you can complete at the end of the session. The link will be added to the chat box. And we ask that you complete that within 24 hours. And then please allow up to three weeks for the Fielding Registrar's Office to email you your CEU. Um, this webinar is being recorded and it's being live streamed on Facebook. So I'm just giving that out as an FYI in case you do not want your tile open. If you'd like to take yourself off um, audio or in video, that's fine. We do want you to be on mute for the most of the session. And at times we will invite you to take yourself off for questions and comments. In the meantime, please use the chat box. I'll be monitoring that the entire time and we really want your engagement and your questions and your comments. Um, so let me now introduce our speaker. I'm so glad she's here. Dr. Gail Greenstein has 25 years of talent management experience. Um, but I'm she's worked in OD and leadership development in a, a variety of large organizations and a range of industries. She earned her doctorate in education at George Washington University, and she got her coaching certificate from Columbia University. And she publishes and speaks about how executive coaches can use an intersectional lens to, to recognize their own biases and blind spots and to create safe spaces for clients. And I'm delighted that she's here. And, and so Gail, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Perfect. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you for the warm welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the country and the world. I'm really thrilled uh, to be here with you. And I met Carrie about four years ago at the Harvard Institute of Coaching, and we were co-presenters. And this presentation was 10 minutes, and I have expanded it over the years, and I'm happy to bring it to you in a little bit more of an interactive way. So four years ago, I created this after my um, certification program at Columbia. And it is about um, an intersectional view of coaching. And back then, there were hardly any Google searches around this field. And the faculty of Columbia said to me, keep going, Gail, this is fantastic. And in the last four years, it's become much more of a common topic. But as you'll see in my presentation, I want to bring you through some of the um, challenges, the flaws, and some of the future directions of what it means to understand privilege and have an intersectional lens. As Carrie said, I work for Novartis right now, um, and I just have to, because my employer requires me to say this, that these are my own views and they don't represent the views of my current employer. So in the time that we have, I want to go through four chapters, if you will. I want to share a little bit of personal journey, what brought me to this work. I want to give a bit of a perspective on the field of diversity and inclusion and why it's not enough for coaches. And part of what I'm passionate about is the limitations of that work and how having an intersectional lens is really important for coaching. I wanna go through a little bit about why does intersectionally ma intersectionality matter? I know that's a handful of a word. And what does that really mean as an executive coach? And last, I wanna focus on um, how does it really apply to coaching and what, um, what can you gain from having this kind of lens and more sophisticated approach in your coaching? So I will hope to bring you through these four chapters. So before I start, I um, would just like you to reflect and think about this question, because in this next 45 minutes, I want to have you think about what you might be awake to and what you might be asleep to. And all of us 
are on a journey from what we might be asleep to, to raising our critical consciousness. So think about what has it been like for you to coach someone who is similar and or different than you in terms of race, class, gender, sexual orientation, or really other identities. And if you want, just write some thoughts in the chat and Carrie might select a few to just read out to me. Just think about what it's been like for you. So there's one comment here from Diane. She says, I've worked in the space of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I still need to be aware of my privilege in each interaction. Another person said that sometimes it puts them on guard. Mm -hmm. um, another person as an African-American woman, all of my clients are white. It's difficult to be seen sometimes as an expert. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, another individual who's African American said most of his clients are white men. So it's interesting to see how everybody's experience is different, but I really liked what the first person said, which is I have to be fully aware every yes. single time. Yes. So depending on where you're coming from, um, you will have a different answer. But I just want you to think about what you might be asleep to and what you might be awake to and um, how that might shift the, the, the lens that you take when you're coaching. I'm freezing up a little bit here, hold on. Okay, so, um, so I wanna share a little bit of personal context um, and use a quote from Tim Wise, which um, has written a fantastic book called White Like Me. So around 25 years ago, I actually was in a nonprofit um, and we were doing work in the courts um, we were a group of white women with people of color, and we were working very closely together to try and really understand what kind of disparities there were in the court systems in New Jersey. And um, through that work, um, I uh, really overburdened a woman of color repeatedly. And it was something that I didn't share with anybody because I really was blind to what I was doing. It wasn't until um, this colleague came to me in a public way and um, called me on the months and months of um, really burden that I put on her. And because we were in a group that part of our work was also to raise our own critical consciousness, we had to practice what we preached also as white women. So I went through a whole process of really victimization, not understanding what I did. Um, I actually had to write a letter of repair on the harm that I caused. And it was that multi-year journey of really trying to understand the harm that I caused that brought me on this journey. And when I was challenged about my white privilege, I remember saying, why does everything have to do with that? And I chose this quote at the bottom because it was during that time, 20, 25 years ago, that this quote just stuck with me about white privilege is like Times New Roman on the computer because Times New Roman, as we all know, is the default position um, on your computer. And it was really a default position for me to learn how to um, um, dismantle some of those barriers um, that I had been, um, that I had earned and that I ha had um, really lived as a white person. And so it wasn't until I was challenged and began to learn myself that I began to see that I needed to bring this consciousness into the work um, of coaching and into the work of consulting. And so now where I am, I'm not done with my journey. I can't coach someone without having a more sophisticated lens, but it really started with a, a, a very personal, very harmful action that was on the part that, that, that I had on my part. And it wasn't until I was held accountable publicly that I really began to shift. And so I want to talk about what it means um, around it, what intersectionality means. Now, this word um, has been in the press quite a bit in the last four years since the 2016 election and, and often before. Um, but the word has been claimed by everybody from the UN um, to IBM, and it's often misunderstood. So I want to go through um, some of the roots of this. And many of you um, may be aware of some of the roots of this. So before I go just through the classic definition, 
Um, I can't see your raised hands on Zoom because I'm in presenter mode, but Carrie can. So how many have heard the word intersectionality? Let me pause. Well, lots of thumbs up. Okay. Um, yeah, I would say a great deal. Some hands up as well. Yeah. Perfect. So how many know what the word means? Uh, more hands, more thumbs up, but some also coming down. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, so let's talk about it. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. So, um, those of you who have heard of it, you may know Kimberly Crenshaw. These these views are um, certainly been around for decades. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw, as many of you may know, is a legal scholar. And in the 1990s, she was doing work with black women um, around issues of employment. And she noticed that the ways in which the oppression um, was multiplied for um, uh, those women who were also black. And so she's obviously a scholar on critical race theory and coined the term intersectionality. And I love the image of the road signs because it really looks at the ways in which multiple identities coexist and complicate the ways we think of this. And one of the things that I'm passionate about is bringing a more complex lens to the coaching um, because diversity and inclusion, sometimes that literature, that practice and that theory sometimes doesn't take into account these multiple identities. And, um, you know, as I've been doing research, as I've been speaking around the country around this, I've really gathered feedback from people about why coaches may not talk or think about these things. And from what people have told me, um, it's varied. Um, they might be unaware of their own privileges. Um, they may be blinded by considering other intrinsic factors. So um, many times coaches really focus on more intrinsic psychological things like Myers-Briggs styles and thinking styles, and it doesn't really even come into their landscape. Um, I've been told that there's sometimes fear to even talk or think about it. Um, for those that are, uh, um, I had a, a man that I was coaching a coach, an African-American man who said, um, I need to really be taken seriously. And I know people are questioning my background. And so the fear came from a different place for him than it may be also for someone of a different race. Um, there may be people that may not have the confidence in how to use this kind of lens or have the language. Um, there's been some human resource people that told me, Gal, gosh, I would never bring any of these things into the conversation. And that's been a learning journey for those folks who feel like they don't even know what to say. Um, there's also the, the, the bottom right uh, speech bubble, if you will, is that coaches, and this is where I'm very passionate about, coaches may not really um, be as aware on where their client's social location. So social location is a, is a term that you may or may not be familiar with. In a sense, it's where all those road signs intersect. They may not be clear about where their client's social location intersects with uh, yours, if you will. And I'll talk about that, that a little later, because when we think of intersectionality, it's important to look at identities and people in comparison to each other. So these are some of the things that I have found about why coaches may not think or talk about some of this. So um, before I go into why inclusion isn't enough, one of the things I also want to just highlight around intersectionality, because um, I've used the word multiple identity, I've used the word intersectionality. Intersectionality is not an identity, it's an analysis. And um, that's an, that, that um, very brilliant way of thinking about it comes from a, a scholar, Rinku Sen. And it really helped me um, dispel some of the confusion around this. And I'll bring that in when we, when we um, talk a little bit later. So um, I have a quote from my mentor, Rhea Almeida, who is actually somebody who's groundbreaking in training therapists in this kind of lens. And I've taken a lot of that knowledge and work because I work in a family center as well, um, not on my work time, but in, in personal time. And uh, this quote really encapsulates a lot of why inclusion is not enough, is that power is always exercised in one way or another. Um, and it's, um, 
intention sometimes intentionally or unintentionally misused and harms others sometimes at the individual group and institutional level. And why inclusion is not enough is that um, I just have three points here. Um, I, I could go on and on, but for the purposes of this, I just want to highlight three, three pieces here. Um, the statistic I have there is from a few years ago, but it's still, it's still relevant that institutions are still led by white leaders. Um, no surprise to many people here. And so a lot of the diversity and inclusion initiatives have not really moved the needle in some of the ways that um, diversity and inclusion are represented in corporations. The big thing, and if it's, if it's one thing that you maybe take from this, is that diversity and inclusion rarely analyzes whiteness. Now, I have seen the DNI world start to shift a little bit, but it also is um, still using safe language. Um, and part of it is that it often doesn't start with analyzing whiteness, which if you don't, then it's really hard. It's um, almost counterintuitive to have an intersectional lens. One of the things that happens with diversity and inclusion, and I'm sure many of you, have, I've been through dozens of workshops, dozens of conferences, is that often that language stereotypes and homogenizes groups. And if it's one thing I wanna get across to everybody here is using that intersectional lens helps you understand the cultural identities are, are more multiple and cannot be constrained within a single identity of culture. And when you're coaching, to have that sophisticated lens helps you really be able to see that. And I think really to more liberate people in their development. Um, so um, just three points to think about, and I'll come back to the diversity point a little bit later. So what I want to share with you is something called a hierarchy tool. Um, and um, this quote here um, encapsulates some of what I want to share. It really moves away from um, knowing the other to knowing the other in context. Now, if we were um, maybe in a workshop where we could talk a little bit more, I, I might ask you a little bit more about how many of you had kids and um, you know what that experience is like. Um, and um, many of you probably know that based on where people live and zip codes often determines the resources and the access that they have. And what Rhea Almeida has done in the groundbreaking work with therapists, I believe can really translate to coaches. I don't wanna debate, I'm not talking about the similarities or differences with therapy and coaching, but I think that there's a lot of um, merit to using this tool as, um, as you look at your coaching. And so there's a lot here. Um, if we had a little bit more time and maybe at some point I can come back, I often use popular media to get people to deconstruct some of this, um, some of this framework. So let me just walk you through a little bit about what this is. So, um, so this hierarchy of power, privilege and oppression is something that, um, like I said, is used to, to train therapists and I'm using to also train coaches. And in a way, this lens is more of a sociological lens. And if you think about this, it's really how the collective is organized. So when I talked about zip codes and you can relate zip codes to health outcomes, to education outcomes, that sociological perspective is really in this map. It's really in this charted form. And one of the things that is important to know is that the, the, um, the top and the bottom is more of the stability of this hierarchy of power, privilege, and oppression. So at the top, you have wealthy uh, white men, cisgendered, um, cis cisgendered um, males. Now, one of the things about this, I know it's two-dimensional, but one of the things about this is that these columns are fluid. So power, that's why I said it's really important that we talk about power. Um, and I don't mean power in a corporation, I mean power and access to resources, because some identities have more power than others, but they're fluid, not fixed. And that's a concept that's a little bit more challenging to understand sometimes when you're thinking of how to apply this to coaching. So when I said the, the top and the bottom of this hierarchy are stable, it doesn't mean that people's identities don't shift. 
And I was once in a workshop and someone was talking about um, identities don't change. And she made a joke, something about um, Michael Jackson's identities change with skin color. And I was, she was talking about intersectionality and I, I thought, oh no, this is not the way we talk about it. What, what, what I mean by identities shifting or power or, or identity shifting is a white man could lose power by losing his job. And he might go down that column of class with race. Um, I, let's say um, recently coached someone who was Latina and Palestinian. And so what um, she chooses to lead from, lead with in what environment sometimes shifts and sometimes changes. And so sometimes when she's leading with her Muslim identity, she may um, often feel less power sometimes when she leads with a, her, a, a, her Latina identity with certain environments, um, she has a different kind of access to power. And so this hierarchy of power, privilege and oppression really helps um, you think about um, how identities are multiple and how sometimes different identities come with advantages and different identities come with disadvantages. Um, I'm trying to think of what other, um, so, so just, to, just to kind of summarize a few points here. So um, the collective um, at the top and the bottom is stabilized. It really, if you think about this as a coach, part of what your goal is, is to really take a lens where you can understand the lived experiences of the people that you're working with to create that safe space. Um, and as a coach, the power that we have is through our language, our language to name, our language to question. And part of that gift and that skill that we bring to this is really understanding those lived experiences and really getting connected to the identities of the people that you're coaching and how it also compares to yours um, and what advantages and disadvantages that has and varying levels of power. I'll, I'm gonna bring you through some case studies later to maybe bring this a little bit more to life. But one of the things I also wanna leave you with is that fluidity that sometimes people's power shifts based on different contexts. Um, the, the head of diversity and inclusion in, in my organization, um, when he, um, he just shared a story when he was coming from the airport, um, he was stopped by the police, African-American man, um, you know, very different kind of power than maybe if he's in a corporation and he's in his position at work. So um, it, it's looking at identities in the shifting context that I think sometimes complicates our work as coaches. Um, so let me bring you through a little bit more about why this matters and how you even use it. So what Kimberly Crenshaw talks about if that we aren't inter intersectional, some of us and the most vulnerable are going to fall through the cracks. And one of the things that I love is this quote from Andre Lord, which many of you um, may be familiar with, that there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. And part of the reason why I'm so passionate about using an intersectional analysis and approach is that I believe you can create a much safer space for the people that you're coaching. Now, when I present this, some of the things that people um, react to is the word power and really look at power in the hierarchy in the workplace. And that's a reality. But the lens that, th that I'm using here and advocating is a little bit more, as I said before, a sociological lens that really looks at access to resources, um, access to wealth accumulation and access to power in society. Um, you know, you could go around the world and go to hotels around the world and, and still see that the people leading those corporations are, are white men. So this kind of work translates not only globally, but I don't want people to get confused by sometimes the hierarchy in organizations. That certainly makes a difference. And we know that sometimes people have power, um, but 
looking at things with an intersectional lens um, helps you, I think, have a little bit more of a sophisticated view of power. Now, so I've talked about, you know, maybe some limitations with the diversity and inclusion. I've talked about a little bit of a hierarchy um, and, and what that might do to help you think about the complexity of identities. But why should coaches have this intersectionality lens? What does it really have to do with coaching? So part of what I am advocating is that coaches should really understand their social location, really where your road signs intersect. Um, and, and it may be complex. Someone may have class privilege, but not racial privilege. And um, someone may have male privilege, but not um, racial privilege. So the complexity of your social location, it's important for you to be on your own journey um, and also how that intersects with the person that you're coaching. So really understanding how your identity intersects with your coachee is I think part of what I think is really useful um, um, to have as, as an analysis. Now, like I said before, coaches, our gift and our craft is what we name and what we question. And so um, with an intersectional lens, you know, people have asked me, gosh, Gail, I would never say anything. Or, you know, if I'm a person of color, you know, how, how does this work? Um, and so, so there's no easy answers, obviously. But one of the things that I think I advocate and what I'm espousing is using more general questions in the beginning to let that person's identity reveal itself. There may be someone who is a, 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 a person of color that may not identify with that identity. And, and one of the things that I know I wrote about when I graduated from Columbia is the non-directional nature of questions. Um, I loved Columbia, but their uh, perspective also was um, based on a lot of the roots of coaching, which is very non-directional. There's a lot of critique of that approach. Um, and that's what I am also advocating is really thinking about how you can think about your coaching naming some of the context that that person is in and um, helping them see what those hurdles are based on their identity. But allowing those questions that you have to be more broad in the beginning to allow for that person's identity to reveal itself. And I also think one of the things that I've really grown and I'm still growing is when I'm coaching is thinking of my questions and thinking of how I name things, not just through my lens as a white woman, but also uh, through the lens of the other person in front of me and really trying to understand the complexity of their identity and how that might shift in different contexts. Um, the other reason why I think coaches should have the, an intersectional lens is around blind spots. I um, I like to say I, um, I'm on this journey, I still make mistakes, but I think of it as a rubber band in that um, in the beginning, I uh, snapped when I made missteps and blind spots. When I make a mistake, I can kind of recover that rubber band. It kind of snaps back a little bit quicker because I have people surrounding me who hold me accountable to not misusing my privilege or the power that I have. But in terms of blind spots, I wanna just say that the standard as a coach, um, I think all of you wanna have an excellent high standard. The, the standard should be how intersectional your analysis is. And what you do with it is up to you. Um, but if you don't have a sophisticated lens that I'm advocating here, I do think it really limits your ability as a coach to see somebody in their context. And diversity and inclusion often sees the person and what I'm advocating is seeing them in a larger context of the privileges, the advantages, and the power that they may or may not have. So one of the things that I have gathered in all of my diversity inclusion workshops and all of the things that I've seen, and sometimes I want to jump out of my chair because the, the espousing of the iceberg is something so prevalent in the coaching world. And one of the things that I think it's important is um, to really understand that, that your coaches' internal experiences are important. Um, there's a lot of focus on feelings. Um, 
in coaching, but that they need to be understood in context. So uh, I, I'm sure many of you have seen this. And what the challenge is with the iceberg is it often kind of equalizes some of these identities. Um, and, and I'll show you a little bit more of what I've, what I've seen when people start to talk about intersectionality in an incorrect way. But one of the things that is really important is that you think about the person's experience, but in context and not just focus on the feelings, which is where I think sometimes coaching has, has landed. So I went to a conference. Uh, I, I'm always trying to see what everyone else is doing around intersectionality to learn and grow myself and my scholarship. And I went to a workshop where they were um, talking about intersectionality. And there was a worksheet here. And I just grabbed, um, screenshot some of the descriptors in the worksheet. And, and this was really a headline about intersectionality. And you'll see there's everything there from animal lover to extrovert to spiritual to foodie. And you may hear people espousing, you need to tell your diversity story and one of the things that is very challenging if you really want to take an intersectional lens is that all of this language tends to homogenize and neutralize the, the identities and the power that people have and maybe the shifting identity that they, they might, might have. Like I um, talked about the woman I was coaching who is um, 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 Latina and also Palestinian. And so when even you see intersectionality workshops or intersectionality um, concepts, it's important to have a critical eye because this workshop, I do think really missed the mark and equalized everything. And I find that often happens a lot in the DNI world and when we're training coaches, which is why I'm so passionate around a more sophisticated lens. So when you have a lens of intersectionality, what I have found and what I have seen firsthand, and I'll share some case studies with you, is that um, clients don't internalize disappointment. I can't tell you how many times that I've heard people, when I've named the context, when I've had more directional coaching and not just relied on questions, is that you almost feel the relief coming through. And so the benefits to clients is that um, people don't internalize disappointment. The other thing that I have really seen, and I, I call this more a liberation-based approach to coaching, I have really seen it um, liberate people when they're seen more in context. When I said before that I've learned a lot of this from the, um, my mentors who are actually training therapists, you can liken it to when therapists are, are counseling, let's say a, a, a low wage, woman who's a person of color trying to get to therapy and missing appointments. There's many therapists that might say that that client, that, um, client or patient is not committed, but to have a more sophisticated intersectional lens is to understand the many forces operating on that woman getting to therapy appointments. The same way that the therapists have that lens, I try and bring that lens into the corporate world and the coaching world. And I can't have someone come to me and say, will you coach so-and-so without me trying to understand the identity of the person and also the identity of that person's manager because those dynamics is, are also important for you as coaches. So you could begin to help your clients not internalize the point, uh, disappointment and feel more liberated. This, this um, cartoon is a favorite of mine. Um, affirming one's place at the uh, equity table. Um, you know, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam and please climb that tree. You see everything from a fish to a, um, other animals. But one of the things that happens is we always sort each other out. So that hierarchy that I showed you, we all sort each other out, whether we like it or not. When your client walks in on Zoom or in person, whenever we get back to that, people are sorting each other out. They're sorting you out. Um, and so it's important to really have this kind of analysis to be able to, um, to, be able to have, a, have a, a lens of also equity and justice, if you will. So some case studies. So um, I was presenting this at 
Columbia. And there was an African-American man, um, a bank executive who um, loved this work and said, Gail, please keep going. We need coaches who have this lens. And he said, I am not comfortable going to evening work functions. And the coach that I have does not understand as a black man, I never feel comfortable. I have not felt comfortable in my whole career going to those kinds of settings, going to those work functions, if you will. And um, the person who was in the, there was another person in the room um, who was an HR person who said, well, what Gail is presenting, I would never really, um, I would never really um, even say she was, she was a, a very senior HR leader. And so she told this man, I would just, she said, if I were, if I were your manager, I would tell you to go to more work events. And the head of Columbia sort of jumped up and said, that's exactly the point. You know, the, you've missed the point. It's really understanding the lived experience of this person. And so I have had many HR people say to me um, that they're very uncomfortable um, with this. And, and this HR leader really was. She um, had a real blind spot. And this man had coaches like her and you could feel the palpable disappointment that he had. Um, I also, when I presented this, when we, we, we were able to meet in person at Columbia Global Coaching Conference, I had a woman, um, person of color, turn to all the white men in the room and say, you don't know how to coach me. I hope, you know, and, and, and visibly also emotional. Um, and so there's a lot of pain with um, coaches who may not be able to see the lived experience and the person in the, um, um, with their larger cultural context. Um, so when I say an intersectional lens or an intersectional analysis, uh, and when I say shifting identities, um, people's identities are complex. Um, and when I was at a media company, I was coaching a, a gay white male executive who was not out at work, but out with friends and was really struggling with being told to be more assertive by his manager. So the coaching took on more of a complexity and, and all of this happen when we had developed more trust. And so this is just not your first intake. And that's why I'm very passionate about more open-ended questions in the beginning to allow people's identities, if possible, to reveal themselves. Sometimes um, um, they don't. But that is a, an example of someone's identity. When I say identities shift in different contexts, this person had a different sense, a different kind of power and advantages um, at work than not at work. And so those kinds of things, when I say shifting, I, I mean, think about the complexity of someone's identities because they're multiple. Um, I recently gave this presentation to another group of, was it was in coaches, HR prof professionals. And um, uh, a white woman came to me after and, and said that um, she didn't feel comfortable with any of this that we should all just respect each other and feel comfortable with each other and treat each other as equals. And I've obviously heard that many times. And she said that when she was coaching a woman, an African-American woman who came to her because she was mistaken for another woman, I mean, clearly it was a very racist inc um, incident. Um, this HR professional just told her you should, you know, uh, she actually said we should all follow the rules in kindergarten, <laughs> that book in kindergarten, which it said we all, we, I forget the name of it, but whatever we learned, we learned in kindergarten to treat each other with respect. That was her coaching of that woman. And so um, that woman was not seen and was not, that experience was not named. And that coach unfortunately had a blind spot and did not really do service to um, the person that was entrusting her with some of this um, anxiety and, and experience. And so, um, you know, when I, when I presented this, there people often say, well, I need things to say, I need things to do. And I wish, you know, this, this is a journey, this is a self-improvement journey, so it, there's no script. But because I'm asked for a script so much, I just took a very small, few lines of a situation that I actually had a real coaching situation um, where there was um, a woman who um, was um, um, 
lesbian. And she was sharing with me that the marketing leader at headquarters held the meeting to discuss everyone's career and mobility policies. And, um, and I knew this was deep into our coaching. So I, I knew what that might feel like. So I asked her what that experience was like. She was able to say it was really hard because the families that they were referencing was not like mine. And her family didn't apply when they were talking about the relocation policy. And so when I, when I talk about having an intersectional lens and, and um, not coming from your own vantage point, I was able to name because there was trust um, um, the cultural context that I saw and was able to talk about the policies that were set up for heterosexual families. And I have to say that the, the naming it, and I'm sure many of you have experienced this, but naming things and just seeing the relief of being seen and heard allowed more liberation. I mean, that's the only way I can describe it is really a, a liberation-based coaching approach. And so we went, that we went on to then deepen the connection with what to do when she said exactly it was really hard and I didn't speak up. And so that was a vantage point and a turning point in our coaching. So um, implications for coaching. I know I have about three minutes left. So I just want to um, have you reflect, not type in the chat, but to think about that hierarchy that I shared considering race, class, gender, et cetera, where would you place yourself? And maybe your identity shifts in different contexts and where might you place the bulk of your clients? I would love to hear in the chat from Carrie, what implications is what I shared with you today? Um, what might this, what implications does this have for your coaching? So please write in the chat. I would love to just hear some commentary. It's so hard for me not to be live with everybody right now. So Gail, while they're adding some of these answers in, there were a couple questions and I thought I would just go ahead and name them um, yeah. so that we don't lose them. Cynthia is wondering how what you're talking about, how is it different from code switching? And then another person was curious about Eric Hex, Eric Erickson's human development model. And if you've used the racial identity hierarchy and is it similar um, to that model to help coaches understand where they are. And then the last question, I'm just gonna throw out all three that I've seen so yeah. far is, what is the best practice to analyze whiteness? Cause you mentioned that towards the beginning. So be reflecting on those questions. And it looks like we may have you know, Diane answered your question, which is it helps us dig in deeper on cultivating awareness with my client and myself. And I think that's a, an answer to the question around implications for mm -hmm. coaching. Anybody else? You know, Miranda mentioned that, you know, back to your example, just the affirmation, everybody wants to be seen and affirmed. Mm -hmm. And you're naming that and, and that does help let go of the disappointment. And there's something about hitting the nail on the head, I think that Miranda is mentioning as well. And Christine says, you know, as far as implications, it helps us uncover our own blind spots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, and I will um, get to your questions um, in a moment. I wanna just ask one more, one more question. Um, since coaching is one-on-one, -on -one, um, what are your thoughts around accountability to ensure you are creating safe spaces for clients? Are there, any, are there any thoughts that you have about how you can also hold yourself accountable? Or does anybody have systems in place for accountability? I'm just curious about that. So Reem says it's imperative and paramount that you don't look to your client to teach you about their identity. Yes. Um, but that is such an important factor that I've yes. had to learn the hard way as well. So thank you, Reem. I think it, it kind of covers a lot of answers to these questions you've asked. Yes, I love that. Marcia's curious, can you say a little bit more about what you mean by accountability? So, um, so accountability, um, I can only speak for how I've been held accountable. 
So accountability is someone really checking with how I might be using or misusing my power. So for example, um, I, in a prior job, had a, had a, a, a manager, she was uh, South Asian, and it, I was new in the job and she was bringing me up to, I, I was telling her about some of this work, some of this work um, that I was doing outside of our, the organization. She loved it. You know, she, she wanted more of it. And then in the, one of the first meetings that we had after that, she was telling me about um, some projects with senior managers. And I really dismissed some of what um, she was saying. She wanted to have the employees have more of a voice. And I was in many ways um, dismissing, giving the associates a voice by my coaching in that situation. She was visibly angry, um, uh, cut me off, ended the meeting soon. I did not know what happened until I checked in with some people. And it wasn't until they said, well, did you see how you just shared all of your awareness and all of your work? And then you proceeded to align with the systems of power in the organization and not support her view to unleash sort of the, the, the power of the associates. And, and, and so that's what I mean by accountability is, is um, not only when someone is upset, but also checking to see um, how to, uh, how your identity might intersect with your clients and really having that safe space with someone who is not in your organization, who you can run things by. I don't know how I could do this work if I don't have people to check in with, like safe people to check in with. That's what I mean by accountability. Um, so the, let me just get through a couple of things and then I could answer some of those questions, just some closing thoughts. And it, it relates to some of the things that I heard. Um, so I hope that this might just give you a focus on broadening your lens because I do think clients, at least from my experience, um, will experience an expanded and liberated view of their development. I had another person come up to me at a workshop and say, you know, it wasn't until I heard this that I realized that the problem was not me, it was the white coach that I had. And she said, I hadn't really even thought about it that way. So, um, you know, that was someone who was coaching a person who did not have an intersectional lens. Whoever said that um, with the second point, be mindful that it is not um, black indigenous people of color to, uh, to, to educate you or to, to end this. Um, uh, you know, these systems of oppression. So it's, it's your work to do. And, um, you know, there, there are many of us who have benefited and have advantages. And some of what has to happen when we're coaching is really letting go of what's benefited us every day. And um, to continue to raise your um, consciousness. The person that said, how do you, the question Carrie was around whiteness, raising awareness with whiteness. Uh, I, I think that's a bit of a workshop in itself, but I do believe that usually we are more associated, uh, those of us who are white might be more associated with people who have power, may not really um, think about those who may not have as much power as us. And so really diving into some social justice work is the only way that I have learned learning this because I'm not done. I stand on the shoulders of many people and also having systems of accountability um, because we all make mistakes. Um, and so um, before, before I ask sort of what, what um, is the biggest insight, I just want to answer some of the questions. Carrie, what was the racial identity model that the person asked? How is it similar or different? I didn't hear the name. Erickson's, and, and maybe what I should do is invite that person to take themselves off mute. I'm, I'm scrolling back through um, to see if I can find the comment or question again. Um, do you mean Eric Erickson? I believe so, yes. And it was from Amy, you know, how, okay. how of the racial identity hierarchy is it similar to Eric Erickson's, Eric Erickson's, I can't even say the name, <laughs> development model. 
I, I was a psych major, but it was so long ago. But Eric Erickson, I, I, you know, I believe his theory is very intrapsychological. I don't believe Eric Erickson's theories of development is more of a sociological lens um, that has power, privilege, and oppression as a part of it, which is why there is so much around the mindfulness field and adult development right now um, in, in leadership in the leadership development world that do not take this lens that I shared with you today. So there's thousands of executives being trained in adult development, whether that's Eric Erickson or mindfulness. And those theories don't take into account the different identities and the advantages and disadvantages that people have. And so I think they're really limited. I, I do think Eric Erickson is probably more of a white male Eurocentric view of adult development. Um, so I hope that answered that question. For The other question was on code switching. Does the person wanna come off mute and share a little bit more about the question? Yeah, this is Cynthia. I was asking because you were kind of talking about um, how one of your clients was leading from her Latina identity yeah. or lean. And so I was just trying to get a sense of, you know, how does that relate to code switching? Because we step in and out of our identities from a code switching perspective. So yeah. how do those two things kind of match up? Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's a label that's um, really useful because she, she does do that and labels that herself. Um, and as a coach, um, I mean, she knows she's doing it. Um, and, and as a coach, it's important for me to understand that switching to be able to understand the different contexts that she's in, the different uh, uh, um, kinds the of power. The amount of stress, the amount of energy that takes. <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot of energy. Yeah, it does, it does. So um, it is a good point. And um, the last question was around whiteness, right, Carrie? What was the specific question? It was around best practices and analyzing whiteness, but I think you you sort of answered that already. Um, but I did want to invite Amy, if and I'm just so much great interaction on chat. But Amy, if you want to take yourself off mute and say a little bit more around the racial identity hierarchy that you're referencing. Yeah, so I, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. Yeah, so I just recently was introduced. So I'm working with um, a university on uh, an anti-racist um, principles within their school. And yeah. they have been looking at something called the racial identity development hierarchy, which isn't, isn't Eric Anderson it's um, Eric Erickson's um, hierarchy, but rather a model that's similar in, in structure to that. Right. But it talks about the um, stages of racial identity development across different racial identities. So um, what it looks like for white people versus right. biracial versus people of color. And I have, um, I'm, you know, I've just recently started to examine it, and I just wondered if you've come across it as a model for which to look at, in some senses, as a coach, mm -hmm. where you are in your own stage of development, as well as where your clients might be yeah. in their stages of development. Yeah. No, I've seen those. I, I, I don't have the name of them, but I've seen those. I've also seen those for kids, which are as a parent. They're also super helpful. Um, I think that is not in opposition to what I'm sharing here. I think the the um, it's more the, the racial identity development. I think fits nicely with this hierarchy. What what this hierarchy has is looking at more the lived experience of the how the collective is organized and sort of power um, and privileges of those identities. So I think it's um different but it's not in opposition for that you know th there's there's um you know a, a man that i was coaching in another organization who was a successor to a white irish woman and he uh, and i was thrown this as a coaching situation and um 
everybody said to me, well, he's just not as open. He, um, uh, you know, and I knew the prior leader who was an extrovert, um, a white, you're American woman. And it was a very co short 360 coaching engagement. So it wasn't something that I would maybe name the context. So people have said, so when do you talk about this? Um, I didn't, I didn't know this person very well, but I do know that he was really offended that people were comparing him to a white woman who was really extrovert and open. And I could sense he didn't feel safe, but I didn't have the trust with him. I didn't know how he identified, you know, I didn't know his racial uh, development, maybe in the frame that you're talking about, but I just kind of, in a way, kept it under the hood, if you will, in my coaching. And it was just guiding me, but not the context that I was naming. I, I, I hope that makes sense because some people say, well, do you always have to like name the per this person's identity in this situation? I knew what it probably was, but it was a very short coaching engagement and it, there was enough trust for me to, to build that. Um, and I didn't know how he identified, back to your point about racial identity development. So, um, so I would love to hear in the, gosh, two minutes that we have, um, was there any insight that you had tonight or is there anything that you appreciate about the session? It would be great feedback. I know Kara will probably do feedback, but I always love to hear, you know, I started this by saying, what might you be asleep to? What might you be awake to? Um, it sounds like this is a pretty critically conscious group and maybe it was just a reinforcement. Um, and so I would love to hear any insights or anything you appreciated. Well, Gail, there was one comment earlier in chat that I just wanted to repeat, you know, the, the aha, it's not just about knowing the other, the client, it's knowing them in their context. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, a, it's a deepening coaching move, becoming more masterful of of really understanding all of their intersections and their context. I just, I can't remember who, who named it, but I wanted to say that out loud. Great. Anything else? Um, Christy says it's, it's insight, so much to learn. Um, and what great resources. I, there, there are some questions around, do you recommend some books, some articles? especially for those of us who are white, you know, to continue to do more deeper work around this. So if there's anything there, um, it, again, great to consider this when coaching, um, the case studies were really helpful, very practical. And uh, this last comment is diving into intersectionality and the points about understanding folks within their context and social location. I like those two words, social location is even more robust than just intersection. Yeah. Since you're since you're in a graduate program, I feel like I could just share those words with you. <laughs> um, and so I, I do want to end with a Maya Angelou quote, um, because I, like I said before, the power that we have is in our language, our questions, but also what we name. And I love this quote. So um, the power of language, they get on your walls, they get in your wallpaper, they get in your rugs, in your upholstery and your clothes and finally into you. So I just wanna send you away with, with best wishes with the power of language that you use. And I hope this has inspired you to really um, think more about this, um, have a more sophisticated lens. And like I said, it's up to you and what you choose to do with it and, and really good luck on your journey because we're all on that journey. So thank you, Carrie, for the invitation. And it's been uh, really great to share this and connect with all of you virtually. Uh, thank you, Gail. You've given us like an appetizer at best. Yes. It's such a topic. I think we could probably spend weeks, if not months, just in the- Yeah, it, yeah. I wish we had more, maybe another time to, to watch some right. film, dissect people's identities. The, that's where the, the real power and learning is, yeah. Uh, but this was amazing and great feedback and chat, which I'll be sure to share with you because we capture all of that. And I just want to say thank you for those who um, attended and who are either joining us live or seeing the Facebook stream. We very much appreciate you coming to these webinars. Building it has such a focus on social justice. And this is right up our alley of what these are the conversations we want to be in. And these are the conversations we stay in within the evidence-based coaching program. So it's a delight to be here. 
Thank you, Dr. Greenstein. And at this point, I'm gonna say goodnight to everybody.